My name is Martin Frank, and I am in Perry, Michigan, at the home of a friend and former APS president, Harvey Sparks, to be interviewed for the Society's Living History Program. Dr. Sparks is a long-standing member of the American Physiological Society, having been a member since 1968. He has been affiliated with Michigan State University since 1979, and his research has focused on mechanisms of active hyperemia and heart and skeletal muscle. Harvey, welcome to the Society's Living History Program. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for agreeing to be interviewed for this series. If you are ready, I would like to ask you a few questions. Okay, let's give it a try. All right, sounds good. Harvey, you indicated on your CV that you were born in Flint, Michigan. Yes. Can you tell us a bit about your upbringing and your parents and what they did, as well as how you got interested in science? Okay, you know, the first thing to say about having grown up in Flint is that I grew up in Flint when Flint was a wonderful city. This is before the, the uh, various companies have left and before uh, there was just a general decrease in uh, the role that uh, ca making cars played in our society, mostly because they were making them overseas too. And, and uh, so as, as, the, as the city became weaker because of the loss of industry uh, and uh, it became unable to support many programs that had previously been there, even though even now there are some wonderful programs in Flint, uh, sponsored by a family uh, which uh, has been a, still done many good things for the city. But it's a very different place. This, the the uh, number of uh, residents is now half of what it was at the peak. Uh, at, at any rate, the, uh, it, it, it still uh, has some interesting neighborhoods. It has a wonderful art museum and some other interesting aspects, but overall the city is only a fraction of what it once was, which is sad, but true. Um, so I, I grew up there, and uh, I, I enjoyed growing up there. The, the, it, was, it was a good town, a good city in those days, and there were lots of interesting things to do, and, uh, and it was a good place to get a, an education. Uh, after, when I graduated from high school, I went to the University of Michigan, where I was uh, in school there for three years, undergraduate, and then after three years I went to medical school. And uh, so I never, never got a degree from the undergraduate program, and some of my friends have said I don't have a degree, uh, and I'll just have to live with that. They did allow me to get my, de my degree in medicine, and that seems to have served me all right most of the time. Well, I, I know a little while ago you and I were talking about how you missed out on your senior year uh, in college as an undergrad and that you missed all the fun year, you just went straight to medical school. Yeah, I got all my, all my courses taken. I was ready for a nice, easy last year. But I made the mistake of, just for the fun of it almost, sending in my resume to, uh, uh, and, and uh, asking whether there would be any chance I could go in after three years. And believe it or not, they said yes which was quite shocking to me. So I said, well, all right, well, I've got nothing better to do. I'll go to medical school. When you were in medical school, you undertook a project with uh, a former APS president, David Bohr. Uh, do you have any recollection of those experiences? Oh, yes. I had a wonderful time working for David. Uh, David was a bright, brilliant scientist who made a lot of important discoveries in the area of uh, biology. He... he um, I started working for him at a point in time that he had just figured out a way to cut very small vessels out of, the, out of uh, organisms so that you could, you could measure the activity not only in large vessels, but also in very tiny vessels that, uh, from various organs. And he really, to a large extent, was responsible for the development of those techniques and, uh, and made a big contribution that way. And was that during medical school or your undergraduate? That was that was that was during medical school, and I, I, I uh, basically took the last year off. I hadn't thought of it this way, but you know, in those days, the medical program was really three years of very hard work, and then the final year you could do a bunch of most, sort of anything you wanted, and so I could I could do that, and so the first thing I did is go find a lab to work in, 
and yeah. that told me something about my natural internations and, and, and so on. So I, I went to work in, in, in the physiology department for a very famous scientist, uh, David, uh, well, David Bohr, and then his, his associate, the, the, the chief of the department. Uh, Horace Davenport. The, and that, that was a, an experience in itself. Any, anyone who has had the opportunity to work for David Bohr, for one and for the, the other, uh, knows they were both bright, brilliant people who loved their work. Who it never occurred they would do anything except the work they did, and so I learned a lot about both being a scientist and also uh, how to be a good one if if I had that tendency. What made you ultimately decide not to become a practicing physician and instead to pursue a research career? You know, I wish I could say that there was a specific approach to that. I. I went to medical school and uh, liked medical school a lot, but was not particularly interested in taking care of patients. That, that I, I enjoyed it. I, I spent in the free, free year when I took my rotations and so on. I, I enjoyed it, but it wasn't as enthusiastic for me as working in the lab. And so by the time I was done with medical school, I had worked very hard in the lab and had published two or three papers and had... Um, decided that at least for the time being, I would like to just pursue my interest in science. And so I went from, uh, from uh, Michigan to Harvard, which some people would say is a step up and others would say it was a step, a step down, down. But, but whatever, it, it was a, another wonderful department with uh, a guy named uh, Cliff, Barger. C Cliff Barger, who uh, was a wonderful mentor uh, and taught me many things about, uh, about science and about life. And I had a wonderful two years with him, and then went to uh, University of Gutberg with yes, Jörn Folkoff. That's right. Thank you for saying that. Uh, <laughs> I'm here to help. Okay. Interestingly, Harvey, as I said, you worked with, with David Bohr at Michigan, yes. who was a former APS president. Yes. You went to, and, and the chair of the department, Horace Davenport, yes. was a former APS president. You did a postdoc with. Cliff Barger, a former APS president. Bjorn Falkow was not an APS president, but he was an honorary member. And so I, I think probably you developed some traits from at least the first three I mentioned that resulted in your ultimately becoming an APS president yourself. Well, probably, that makes sense. Uh, and I, but, but I would include uh, the guy from overseas in that because although he was only an associate member of the of the, the, the club of scientists in our country. The way he t did science and, and, and the problems he approached were very similar to the things we were doing in various labs in this country. So he was very much a very similar character. Uh, he, he was uh, very active also in a big lab. And so really I had the chance to be in th three really wonderful settings, big laboratories, lots going on. And this started for me while I was still in medical school and then I continued after that. So it was, it was a great opportunity, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. When I, when I got to the point that it was time to go someplace after my fellowships, um, uh, I was sort of wandering around the department one day uh, looking for something to do, and, and uh, uh, the department chairman came to me and said, would I like to just stay and be a fellowship and fellow in the department and spend a couple of years doing that? And I said, sure, I was having a good time. I enjoyed the people. I had no particular interest in doing anything else, and so uh, stayed. And uh, after a couple of years, uh, Cliff got a position for me, and I became an assistant professor, and then went, went up to the ranks, probably too fast, but it wasn't my decision. And, uh, and, and uh, certainly I enjoyed immensely doing that. And I might say that if in those days, if one was in a training setup like I was in with, with really, really five great scientists and it got to be time to have your own money, you simply wrote out a, a, a very simple grant to, to the federal government and they gave you a, a, Probably three to five years. Yeah, something like that. Um, support and, and, and said, go try it out, see what happens. And uh, by the time I'd done a couple of years of that, I could see that this was more fun than anything else I'd done. And so I might as well see if I can do it for, for a longer period of time. And so I, I got a, a, a permanent job in the department and stayed in the department until I was uh, uh, 
somewhat older, and then moved on. Har two. Harvey, you uh, referred to getting coming back and taking a job uh, and fellowship. I assume that was at the University of Michigan after Gutberg. That's right. I came uh, back. And, and Horace Davenport offered you the fellowship, and you came in as an instructor and then moved up the ranks to That's professor right. at the University of That's Michigan. Right. Uh, after one of the people who was in the department then, but I think it already moved to Michigan State, was Fran Hattie. Yes, that's right. He, he had gone there two or three years before I ended up going there. And Fran had gone to Michigan State as chair of physiology. Yes. Uh, Fran also was a former APS president. Right. Uh, and uh, you went up to Michigan State in 1979 recruited as the new chair of physiology at Michigan State University. Can you tell us a bit about the transition clearly from being a Wolverine to a Spartan is clearly a big change, uh, as is becoming chair of a department? Yeah, I, I, both were a lot of work and, and uh, now I look back on it and I wonder if it was worth it, but I, I sure enjoyed uh, the chance to look at a different department, see how things were done there. and. What happened there was impossible to predict and turned out to be the best thing that ever happened in my career, which is for, for, for 10 years, we, we went back and forth to Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. and, and I was able to do a variety of projects over there, which resulted in a series of papers which have come out even fairly recently because one of the guys over there was so, so active, uh, not because of anything I've done. Uh, and and uh, so I had those wonderful years over there where uh, I, I uh, could go over there for a few months and one time for a whole year, uh, do some science uh, and enjoy the beautiful karma and, uh, and in general enjoy life. Um, it, the, probably the most amazing thing from the standpoint of the way things operate in this country, is that I was funded during this whole time, I had NIH grants during the whole time I was working overseas. And I would, even when I was gone for a year, I, I managed to arrange someone else to take over my grants for the year, and when I came back, I went back in the lab and had my grants. And I don't think that happens much anymore. Uh, and, and it was, it was it, I think it was good for our department at uh, Michigan State. I know it was good for me, because it, it was such a, uh, an opportunity to contribute to work in another area of the world. So um, I would say that was probably the single most interesting thing that happened. Mostly what I did is what we all do, which is do experiments, try to find out things that we didn't previously know. And I did, I did my share of that, although I've got to say that in retrospect, I look back on it and think that um, I could have done better. I could have found, found ways to make better contributions and more contributions. But I did what I could do and enjoyed it immensely. Well, I think we all do what we can do. One of the roles and responsibilities you have as a department chair is to recruit new faculty and nurture their careers. And can you tell us a little bit about the people you recruited and your philosophy about uh, developing faculty? Well, I, I, I guess I'd start by saying that uh, the first person I recruited was uh, somebody who is connected to people in this room. Alex he, he He came, I mean, I, I think we recruited him during the first few months that, that I was chairman there. And, uh, and he was a wonderful addition to the department. He uh, contributed tremendously to the, the programs in the, in the department for a number of years, and only recently has retired. So uh, he was my first one. Perhaps the one that, uh, was, uh, that I recruited that was most dominant was, uh, <laughs> one of the things about this disease I have is that the hardest thing for me to do is to say the names of people. Okay. So, so uh, I'm, I'm, right now I'm thinking about... Bill Spielman? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Who replaced you as chair as well. That's right. And, and he had a, a longer run at it than I did. I only stayed for a few years. He was chairman for eight, nine, ten, I think 15 years, maybe okay. a little more. And, and ran the department better than I did because he really liked being chairman. And I thought it was something you had to do. 
Um, and, and that I got that attitude from uh, from Michigan, because although he was chairman of the department for a long time, uh, Horace Davenport, the, the, he never liked being chairman very much. He just did it because you're supposed to do something that's good for the department. Well, yeah. I, w I would say that Horace didn't like doing lots of things. And uh, I remember when we invited him for the centennial in 1987, yeah. uh, we sent him an invitation and his response was, nobody cares if I'm there or not, okay? Yeah. You may, he came to the meeting in 1988 in Las Vegas yeah. Uh, because he was the recipient of, I believe, the DAGS Award that year, which was also the year you were president of the society. So I do remember those interactions as well. Yeah, and, and, and he was, you know, despite his, his comments about being chairman, he loved being a chairman, and he loved running a department. And, and I think that he had a lot of problems in his life. He had lost a son. Uh, and uh, I had another son who he had a very distant relationship with. And uh, so life was not easy for him. But he did love the, the work of, of being a scientist and, uh, and, and did some marvelous experiments uh, with very simple equipment that are still stand, as far as I know. Uh, but that's probably enough on him. Yeah. Harvey, you were the, the society's 60th president. Uh, you served uh, in 1988. Uh, your annual meeting was in Las Vegas, which right. we had talked about where we were marching to confront the animal rights right. activists outside of the convention center. But one of the hallmarks of your presidency was your commitment to developing countries. And indeed, it was you who encouraged the society to start sending journals to Zimbabwe, Sub-Saharan Africa, mm -hmm. and many other developing countries. Clearly that passion developed as a result of your experiences in Zimbabwe, and I know you said it was a wonderful experience, but tell us a little bit more about the people and the, the science that was being done there. Well, the, 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 that was a, an interesting and short period of, of uh, and a very interesting co company, country. The, um, the society got its independent fairly late as those things went into Africa. And, and had the advantage of uh, development, further development than most places went because it was, it was under control of a, of a very, very good department in uh, Europe uh, for a number of years. And, and um, so they, they made a few very good choices. The, probably the most important initially was they chose a guy who was on the faculty and he was, he was British. Uh, and, and he became the chairman for the first period of time. And he continued the course the chairman was already set on so that as it became occupied by members of, of, local, of the local religions, uh, it, it, it did well because there were, these were people that had trained and had a chance to understand what it was like to actually have a department and run a department. And, and so when, when, when they began to take over as they did after a short period of time, for, for quite a while, things went very well. And then, unfortunately, um, uh, things that have happened in almost all the countries of, of, of uh, that continent have occurred. The, 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 uh, for, thing, for reasons I can't explain to you, uh, decisions were made not having so much to do with how much money was available, but how it should be spent and who it should be spent on. And as that happened, very slowly but steadily, the ability of the department to, to, to meet its own needs and to continue to grow went down. And, but it left, it was at a pretty high standard then. There were six or seven members of the department, all but one had been trained uh, by people who uh, had come to the department and made contributions. And so the people were all trained overseas. They had PhDs uh, and, and, uh, and, and they were capable of doing work. And they did things, for example, um, I arranged uh, for an extra polygraph machine to be transferred to their laboratory over there. One of these, our, our famous lab. Grass, Harvard last. Grass uh, Chimograph. Right. Or right. Grass uh, yeah. Strip Recorder. Right, with six channels, all worked. 
and uh, and and so they were able to do some experiments that could not have been done anywhere else on the continent probably at that time, and and uh, and so uh, good things like that happened, and, and those were the things that were done yes with some help from outside, but the the local people were well enough trained to do those experiments and understand how to what to make of them. And that was a very magic, very short, but very magic period in Zimbabwe. Uh, the, the, uh, they did a much better job with the, the, the laboratory for medical students than we were doing at that time at Michigan because they hadn't yet realized you could get away with not uh, doing all those wonderful experiments. Uh -huh. and, and so we, we, I got a chance to do experiments I, I had done as an undergraduate, but not in medical school, right. and do them again and do them better and set them up for all the students there to do. So it was a very uh, exciting period. It, I don't think I contributed a whole lot to science, although we did do a very big study on blood pressure control uh, there and found that in, this is actually worth mentioning, uh, the, the, uh, what was happening at, at that point uh, nationally is people were moving from the, the countryside into the city. And they were doing that because suddenly all these jobs that had been held by Americans or, or Europeans or whatever became available to them. And they began to move into town to take advantage of those opportunities. And then as they did that, um, the, the, for reasons that I, I can't, I, I, I never been able to explain, the quality slowly went down. And so the people who were uh, there moved on to other countries. Uh, or, uh, or, or other things happened. So, so the, they, they began to slowly go, go, go to worse and worse conditions. And um, that was unfortunate because it was at a pretty high standard when it, when, when it was turned over to the, 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 to the country. Um, and in t you were saying in terms of hypertension and blood pressure, uh, yeah, so, so we, did, we, 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 we did a study, we, we, we did something that is rarely done in this country. We, we actually measured the pressure of everybody living in a certain little city. I mean, literally got virtually everybody to come in and have their blood pressure measured. And, and um, the, the most amazing thing about that was that there was so much hypertension. Mm -hmm. Here we are talking about people living in a small rural town in, in Africa. Why would there be a lot of hypertension? And then as work continued in a number of laboratories, it became evident that uh, for whatever reason, men and women were both much more likely to have high blood pressure there than over here. Uh, and, and that's been demonstrated now in a number of studies uh, on different populations. And it's, you, always, you always find the same thing. Now, you can find areas where, every, where there is no, there's no hypertension at all. All you have to do is go far enough into the small towns to the mm -hmm. point where you're talking about just towns of maybe a thousand people. And all of a sudden there is no hypertension. And, and, uh, and what's different, well what's different is that when people live the traditional life, they eat virtually no meat, mm -hmm. they, eat, they eat vegetables, and they, they, they live pretty much the way we realize we ought to live if we didn't want to have high blood pressure. Right. And, and, and so uh, that, that was a, a very interesting finding it was, it was not the end, it was only the beginning, because once you know that it's there, you have to discover why it's there. Right. And uh, I never got that, and, and, uh, but others, I think, have done a lot on that, and, 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 and it's there. Uh, now, something else happened, though, that changed everything in, your, in, in that part of the world, and is, that, was, that was the famous disease that started in... Uh, uh, not, not there, but, uh, but elsewhere, but quickly spread to Africa and, in fact, and uh, was a disaster for the continent and still is a major problem. What am I trying to say? Oh, with AIDS? Yeah, with AIDS. Right. Okay. And, and, and for example, at one point, I did, I did a small study because that's all they let me do. And it looked at me like within the city areas, uh, the so something like a quarter to a half of all the grown men had high blood, pressure, uh, high blood pressure, had hypertension, and um, so anyway, over the the next eight years, uh, we we things changed. 
we were unable to do the experiments because we couldn't get the equipment anymore, couldn't get the, 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 the various things we needed to do the experiments. And, and, and then some of the really good people that we had trained began to leave because they were too good to, right. to spend their life working in an area where they could never get anything done. And so the last I checked, which was sometime last year, there was one physiologist in the department, down mm -hmm. from eight. And so all the work we had done to build the department was basically lost. lost. Yeah. And Our, it, that was not the only country where that happened. Yeah. Uh, you have developed uh, a significant research career. Uh, you talked about a couple of the people you had worked with. But in your mind, what do you think were some of the most significant contributions you made to physiology? Well, one thing that we did early on is, is try, try to understand why it is that uh, blood pressure goes up in, in, in certain populations of people. This is along the lines of what I was just saying. And, 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 and the, the, the general approach to that, because it's relatively easy to measure blood pressure very accurately, is to go out and, 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 and find a group of individuals that are either very similar to each other and see if you can detect uh, some pattern there or are very, are, are, are very different. And, 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 and I think the, the general observation is that any group of people from anywhere in the world that are exposed to high, high diet sodium will eventually develop levels of hypertension that are, you would never have expected uh, in the first place. And so the role, we, don't, we, don't, we still don't understand exactly what it is about, uh, about uh, being exposed to high levels of sodium, but there's something about that that causes blood pressure to go up and, and people to die young. Okay. Throughout your career, uh, you have had a commitment to the humane use of animals in research. Uh, I believe you were involved with the Michigan Society for Medical Research. Yeah. Uh, you and I have attempted to encounter animal rights activists. Yeah. Tell us the, about the importance of the humane use of animals in research. Boy, that's such an interesting topic. The, the, uh, of course, it's changed dramatically. If you go back to the uh, early part of the last century, uh, no anesthetics were used mm -hmm. to, to study animals because uh, we just hadn't gotten that far. Uh, there were still people out there who didn't think that animals su suffer. They didn't understand that the, the same pathways were causing the same problems in, in animals. And so we had to go from there to the modern view of animals, which is that they're uh, also living creatures with active you know, systems, and that if you don't, if you if you don't use anesthetics, they feel pain, pain just like we do. Uh, but uh, through that all, through all those years, and that would be almost the the the, the century that we just left, um, animals played a very important part in where we are today. Uh, so many things about it have changed. When I started doing experiments on, on, on animals, uh, as, a, as actually as a, a student in the laboratories in Ann Arbor, um, really the only thing we did is put them to sleep. There was, there was not much more to our treatment of animals than that. And probably they, we didn't do that very well a lot of the time. And, and it, it simply rep represented the, uh, the state of the art at the time. Uh, and then as, as the, the decades went by, uh, the, the second half of, the, uh, of that period, small things were, were discussed. And e and each little thing we did made a few more animals either treated more kindly and more uh, efficiently, or, or possibly we didn't do the experiments anymore because we found other ways to go at things. And, and so we, we, we've reached the point now, uh, not that we don't have more to do, but still, where, where uh, very few animals are subjected to uh, conditions which are, uh, hurt them. Uh, there, there are certain experiments that need to be done and can only be done with the understanding that it's going to cause pain in the animal. But the vast majority of animals used in experiments now uh, never, never, discuss, never have any pain at all because they're, the first thing that happens to them is they're put to sleep. And, and, and they never, they never s suffer any problems. Um, you, you could say, well, um, but we wouldn't need to have the animals at all uh, in that case. But, but of course, that, that's not true either, because there are so many things that we can do in an animal 
that we can't do an experiment. And, uh, probably the most dramatic example of that is the ability now to work on instrumented animals that are wide awake. Harvey, let me ask you one last question for the interview. And clearly you've had a very long career, a uh, successful career. You've had nurtured new faculty. You've seen lots of graduate students and postdocs. But one of the things that we're always interested in knowing is as an established scientist, a successful scientist, what advice would you have for young people starting out today? Okay, I think I have a pretty clear, clear approach on that. Um, I think the fact is that if a person wants to be a scientist, they should go ahead and do it. Uh, the, the, um, it, it they won't necessarily be successful because it's, it's hard to do that work, whether you're doing it on a grant or you're doing it on money from a private foundation or where the money comes from. It's, it's not easy to do good experiments that mean anything to anybody else. And, and so um, uh, I would I'd, I'd just say, if you want to do it, you should do it. And, and, and you, you'll simply have to put up with the conditions that are not as good as they once were, but are still very good. There's still a lot of very good scientists doing very good work all over the country. And that's still possible. Some more of them are on, on, on contracts that don't give them lifelong uh, training or opportunities. But but still, it's possible to find settings that are really very fine, very very good for science. And and uh, I think it's up to people in the field to continue to point out to young people that they're, they're, that this is an area where. You can, you can make a career, you can have a lot of fun, and you can do a lot of good for society. So um, I would I'd really recommend, let me put it another way. I've thought a lot in recent years about what I should have done with my life. We all, we all get to the point eventually, if we, if we're, if we live long enough, and right. if the, 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 you can hear them going over his head right now. The, the geese, yeah. The geese. Uh, so so uh, if, you're, if you're lucky enough to hit, get a full career like, like I did and like you have, uh, you go from uh, really just kind of an amazement that somebody will pay you to do this to late in life thinking, this is, I can't believe I'm still doing this. This is marvelous. This is what a life, what an incredible life. And, and so I would recommend that anybody who likes science Try very hard to get to find a way to make a living in science. It comes in different packages. Sometimes it comes as a, a job in a university. Sometimes it's a job in industry. Sometimes it's some other role that is played in society, like the, the, the man sitting next to me who's done more for science than most, most of us have done in our individual labs. Thank you. So, so um, I would say be aware of the fact that it's not easy. It never has been easy. It's, it's certainly not easy now. but. They're, we're still hiring people. People still have great careers and enjoy the, the work almost more than anything else you can do. And so I would say don't worry about it. Get, get the best training you possibly can. Spend as much time as you possibly can with good people. I, as you heard, uh, I, I had the chance to work with a number of people who are really high in the field. It made a big difference in my life. You can do that too. And if you're really lucky, You'll end up in a great university doing interesting work. And at the worst, you'll end up working for, uh, in some other very important area of science. So uh, go ahead, do it. Don't hold back. Nothing is easy in this world. And, and go for it and, and, and get the tremendous enjoyment you can get out of playing an important role in society. Harvey. Thank you very much for the advice for uh, young people starting out, but also thank you for your service to the society, uh, as well as your willingness to sit with me today to be interviewed for the Society's Living History Program. It's a pleasure for me to have worked with you as the 60th president of the society uh, and to see you doing well. And uh, I look forward to hearing you uh, talk about your 90th birthday and then your 100th birthday as we go forward. But uh, thank you very much for sitting with me. Thank you very much.